Hello and welcome to As It Comes, live from a musician's point of view. I'm Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and I had a fragile moment the other day. It's no surprise that it's a busy time of year, what with concerts, rehearsals and gigs, teaching which you somehow have to fit in around the increasing pile of tasks such as invoicing, emailing, laundry. So here's the scene. I was sitting during a break at a school where I'd been up very early, feeling fatigued, run down and defeated, staring into space. And then it happened. Tears started rolling down my face. In the words of Jerry Seinfeld, I thought, what is the salty discharge? It's been a long time since I've felt so overwhelmed that I've cried that it really caught me off guard. Thinking about it now, there were so many contributing factors as to why that happened. Tiredness, cold, having to work in a damaging system that enables and facilitates the most entitled in society, hunger, hanger. My mum had just texted me at this point about something completely unrelated. She must have been up quite late, as New Zealand's 13 hours ahead of the UK. But her message couldn't have come at a better time. I replied to her explaining my current situation, saying, Give me strength. She replied straight away, saying, Strength with an arm-flexing emoji. (laughs) And it was all I needed to hear, well, see, to take several deep breaths, which helped prevent the whole situation from snowballing into an avalanche of ugly crying, dig out some tissues, and get on with my day. You might be a strong, independent grown-up, but sometimes, no matter how old you are, you just need your mum to make everything better. It's quite cathartic talking about it, even just here on a podcast. If you're feeling snowed under, I really hope you have someone to talk to about it. We spend so much of our time making it look like we're on it all the time that we do make ourselves quite vulnerable in the process. So, no shame. Have a little cry, have a whinge to a friend, and get in touch with your mum. My guest today is cellist Sophie Gledhill. We had a chat backstage at Snape Maltings while on tour with English Touring Opera about loads of things, including juggling freelance engagements, long-distance relationships, staying positive, and how Sophie's drive to use music for social change has led her to travel the world. This was recorded at the end of October 2019, on the day that New Zealand sadly lost the Rugby World Cup semi-final to England. Boo. Have a listen to my chat with Sophie. Thank you for joining me today on the podcast. I'm very excited to be here. So just to set the scene, we are backstage at Snape Maltings. You may or may not be able to hear a flute player practicing something in the background. No idea. Don't recognize it. No. What? The sound of the flute? Oh, no. I I think I'm there these days. (laughs) It doesn't sound like the opera we're performing, though. It doesn't, does it? And why are we here? I'm not getting existential. Uh, I was going to say, wow, it's a big opener. (laughs) All right, I'll start small. Um, We are here with English Touring Opera Mm -hmm. for their autumn tour. And we're doing, well, last night we did Seraglio Mozart. And tonight we're doing Silver Lake by Kurt Weill. It's a wonderful piece. It is. No one knows it, but they ought to. No. And it's, funnily enough, it's all about a pineapple. Yep. Well, not completely about pineapple, but the pineapple is... Pineapple is the star of the show. It features quite heavily in this this opera, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. What do you like about performing opera? I love feeling like I'm part of something much bigger. So I like feeling like a small cog in a very large machine. Mm. Um, I love being able to work with people, the singers on stage and the set designers, not that we work with them directly, but you know, you Mm. feel like you're connected to them in some way. And the whole Wagner idea of the long German word coming up, Gesamtkunstwerk. Oh, well done. Like, just like a whole piece, a whole artwork containing lots of, Different things, not just music. Yeah. I kind of think with opera, it's almost like the production is recreating something on a grand scale, almost like a film. Yep. Every night. Mm -hmm. Because as we walked in before, we saw all the set people working away, and here we are waltzing and recording a podcast. (laughs) But we feel quite small in comparison, really, because we are just that little cog in a great machine. Yeah. yeah, and it's especially nice. where we sit, we can see the stage. I can't. For better or worse. Okay, I can. <laughs> I'll let you know what happens. But um, I can hear things. Yeah. Yeah. And I can gauge what's happening based on your reaction. 
<laughs> yeah, again, for better or worse. <laughs> How have you fared with this busy schedule? Because you are very busy. It is an especially busy patch. I, um, for the first time in my life, I made a spreadsheet. <gasps> I, can't, I know, I know. I don't recognize myself. <laughs> but I made a, a spreadsheet for these four months just to make sure that I was fitting everything in correctly. It's color coded. What? Okay, I haven't gotten that far with my spreadsheets. Um, I have a spreadsheet for my income and expenses. Yeah, but not I'll, for my I life. Should be really. doing that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm doing Les Mis, the staged concert version at the moment, which is a four month contract. But then I'm fitting in this um, English touring opera season as well. So it's just a question of making sure I've got well, enough depths covering me and making sure you're in the right place at the right time. Right place, right time. I haven't booked two people or zero people or <laughs> you've turned up to the right venue. So far, so good. But there's a month to go. Oh, gosh. Still so, some margin for error. Yeah, watch this space. So just checking. We are performing in Snape tonight, right? Um, we should check the website. <laughs> or your spreadsheet. Where's your spreadsheet? Yeah, good you point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. And your other half is also a very busy freelance musician. Correct. As well. Yes. And I'm sure I can relate to that as well, seeing as my other half is a freelance musician. How do you go about seeing each other when you feel like you're on opposite ends of the country or even the world? Hmm. Well, FaceTime is a great thing and we just just take any opportunity. And we, we've had crazy um, plans to, you know, drive to the other end of the country to see each other for two hours quite often, you really? know. But, you know, we both like what we're doing. And if we get to work together, that happens very occasionally. So mm-hmm. that's nice too. And he happens to be working only about an hour and a half away right Andy. now. So that's like next door. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the hard thing about relationships, maintaining that spark sometimes when you're not experiencing the same things every day. And yes, you can like WhatsApp, you can FaceTime as much as possible, but it's not really a substitute for the actual quality time. Yep. I agree. Yeah. Um, What's the longest you've gone without seeing each other? Six weeks. We actually had that this year and last year. He's done a lot of work in India and South Africa. And then um, this year I was at the Banff Centre in Canada for five or six weeks. And then last year I was in South America for six weeks at a time. So six weeks seems to be the magical number (laughs) magical or not (laughs) best not to like test that barrier yeah exactly that's it oh god i think mark and i did five months apart oh yikes okay you win or lose (laughs) well i don't know i mean that was a long time ago now but that was when i was living in australia and he was living in new zealand and i would like to say that oh it's just a short plane ride away but that's what everyone says but it's actually logistically yeah you've got to factor it in yeah your life exactly because it's still an international flight you've still got to be at the airport like three hours in advance it's just lengthy and then you 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 see each other and then it's like and then you're tired really tired yeah Yeah. and you end up just not really doing anything Mm -hmm. it's really difficult Yep. My teacher in Australia actually was in a long distance marriage with someone Ooh. who worked in Tunisia. Oh, mm. yeah, that's not easy. But I think it seemed to work quite well for her. <laughs> she used to say, if we lived in the same country, we'd probably really annoy each other. Right. Well, it's good to have these insights. Yeah. I suppose. So it might, it might work for some people, but not okay. for everyone. Each to their own. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I could do that. Nope. Yeah. And when will you be in the same city or town together next? 2020. Oh, that's sad. Sorry. <laughs> Actually, I know it's not that far away. No, I know. It's only a few Actually, months we'll, away. Actually, we'll spend Christmas together in Brussels. Oh, lovely. So that's nice. Oh, you have family there, don't you? My brother lives there, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. So you can enjoy some like... I was going to say beer, but you don't drink beer, do you? No. Uh, Christmas one. markets. Okay. Gluevine. Gluevine. Yeah. Do they do Christmas markets in Brussels? Oh, yeah. The German... Big one. Oh, they have them style. everywhere now. Well, yeah, they have them in Hyde Park. <laughs> yeah, I went to one in Liverpool last year. I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah, yeah. The, the traditional Liverpool, Liverpudlian Classic. Christmas yeah. markets. The Beatles. <laughs> Christmas markets. <Beatles> themed. <laughs> Shipping port themed <laughs> Christmas markets. <laughs> it's a winner. Keep it. That's brilliant. So I bet you're looking forward to Christmas. Yes, I always love Christmas though. And actually, I'm very excited because this year, so far, my December has only got Christmas-themed work in it. Really? And to some people, that's probably hell on earth, but I love it. How Christmassy is Christmassy? Because you could have, like, Christmases and, like, Christmas carols, etc., but then also Christmas messiahs as well. You, you're on board with that, that sort of thing? Yeah, I'm always up for a messiah, but I haven't got any of those yet. Mm-hmm. Um, There's still time. There is still time. I've got some Opera North stuff, which is... Um, Christmas concerts. There's um, 
Nutcracker and the Snowman in the same thing. Oh, right. Yeah. With the screen, I think. And mm. then another concert, which is just some classics. Yeah. And then a, a tour of Now That's What I Call Christmas, as in the album, but on stage. Oh, my God. Very excited. How many um, dates is that? It's just four, but it's... Um, okay. Yeah, the album on stage, and I'll just be so happy. Well, it's good that you like Christmas, because that might just drive I know. certain people insane. It, I think Christmas divides people, certainly musicians, because whether they like it or not, they musicians usually have to play a lot of it, a lot of the Christmas. <laughs> play a lot of Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. I haven't done much of like the Christmassy, well, as you say, things like, now that's what I call Christmas, yep. or anything. But it is generally really, really busy, isn't it? And what I like is that feeling of release when you've say like 23rd or 24th of December and you've finished your last engagement I know done until the new year usually yeah and then there's a slight fear of oh my god January (laughs) that big gaping (laughs) hole when there's generally less work and a huge tax bill tax bill (laughs) (laughs) but you know that's the next year it's fine that's for later Sophie yeah deal with yeah you haven't turned the page in your diary yet so it doesn't exist well this is the problem I have is I don't usually buy my next year's diary until quite late Right, so, and then when, so it's not a problem. Well, well then <laughs> it's difficult when people start booking you for yep. things like... The other day I got asked for a concert in March. <laughs> I'm like, I can't comprehend that yet. That's, that's it's funny when people away. say, are you free? And you're like, is that a joke? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm busy. <laughs> I don't know, but I have no way of knowing really because I haven't put down any engagements that I might have. They're not written down. Right. Because I, I have to write stuff down. I can't do a phone diary. No, but, I'm Filofax all the way. Filofax? Yeah. Do you live in the 90s? Yes. Right. Proudly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, January is a tricky time, isn't it? But I think important to relish in that quiet period. Yeah, I think if you've had a busy December and you've managed to like save some money, whatever, then yeah, it can be something to look forward to rather than something to be afraid of. Yeah. This period right now, late October, mm-hmm. has been quite manic. I think October is often one of the busiest times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know why that is, though. No. It's like, because I understand the build up to Christmas and then obviously after the summer, but it's just, it feels like it gets so busy so quickly. It's true. I can't answer that. Who's in charge I'm, of these things? <laughs> I'm here for answers. Who's the master of freelancers? <laughs> no, I'm, there, there, is, there is none, I'm sure. And if, if there is, we'd really like to meet you. <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm grateful for the busyness anyway. Yeah, no, that's true. You, and one mustn't complain. Exactly. I suppose. And... Musicians like to complain, so I try yeah. to fight against that. Do you find yourself staring away from negative attitudes mm. when you can? Yeah, I always try and remind myself that we're really, really lucky to be doing what we're doing. And there's so many people, like when you play a concert and you meet audience afterwards, they say, oh, wow, it must be so amazing doing something you love for a job. And we always go, yeah, yeah, whatever. We've heard that so many times. And then you actually think about what they've said. Yeah. You're like, They're right. Yeah. They're so right. Yeah, and we're getting paid to... Do the thing that as a child we were just doing for fun and at some point it just morphs into something instead of paying to do, you get paid to do. And I know our like travel schedules can be intense and you end up not eating properly and not sleeping (laughs) properly and you can burn out occasionally. But then you just have to play one good piece of music and you're like, oh, yes. Yeah, totally. There are moments where I feel I have to pinch myself, remind myself, oh, you can play the cello. Yeah. It's something that a lot of people would really love to be able to do. And I'm really grateful to my five or six-year-old self for, <laughs> for choosing the instrument when I did and oh. sticking with it. So you, you chose the cello. What made you choose I the cello? I did. So I was a weird child. You know, people are always like, oh, were well, your parents pushy? I'm like, no, I was pushy. My parents just supported me <laughs> you in my yourself. pushiness. I was desperate to play an instrument. So when I was three, I asked my mum to teach me recorder. Really? And then hmm. after about a year, I said, actually can I play a real instrument? Sorry, recorder players. I actually love the recorder, but I wanted to play an instrument that I could play in an orchestra, like stuff that I'd learned about at school. No, I wasn't at school yet. Where was I? At monkey music or whatever I went to. (laughs) So I went to my local music school, Harpenden Musical. For some reason, they just decided when I was five that I was a string player. Really? It's based on my personality, maybe, or... Curved fingers. Yeah, no idea. No idea. Maybe because I was just a quieter person than my sister and she's a wind player. Oh, really? Is um, that a thing? Do people think wind players are Who knows? Loud. Who knows? Maybe they just needed string players in their orchestra at the time. Well, that's true. The endangered instruments. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so they let me try 
all different string instruments. And my sister was actually there in my ear saying, pick the cello, it's really cool. Oh, that's so nice. Um, and I went, she's right, it is yeah. pretty cool. It's big, that's fun. Can't fault the cello. No, and I'm so grateful. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, silly thing for two cellists to say, but I think of all the string instruments, it's the best one. We did well. <laughs> we, we, Bravo. Did, we did all right. <laughs> the reason why I chose the cello is because my best friend at primary school was signing up to do cello lessons Aww. and I was behind her in the queue and we were like oh should we do cello lessons together we're so impressionable <laughs> so we um we embarked on Saturday morning lessons together Aww. in a pair and she stopped after one year and I never stopped and here you are <laughs> yeah. couldn't kick the habit <laughs> yeah she was like you're still going <laughs> yeah <laughs> didn't you leave oh it's, it's really interesting to hear how people get into playing the cello but of course I read something on your blog recently Ooh. how you view the instrument how you view the cello and you regard it as the instrument that resembles the human voice the mm. closest and also it is an instrument to make sound and this sort of leads on with your creative projects mm. that you've been working towards do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been working on outside of the crazy freelance Okay. Cello music making. Oh gosh, where do I start? So I, I bet you never feel completely satisfied unless I've got my own individual project going on, even if it's just something I'm thinking about and not necessarily doing. As if I've got something else on the go, I feel more like me, like something that I'm really interested in. About three or four years ago, I sat down and suddenly decided, yes, I want to record one song on the cello from every country of the world. So I'm a travel addict, self-confessed. Mm -hmm. There's no way I can get to every country in the world. And also my conscience is suffering in terms of flights. Carbon footprint. Yeah, mm. it's an issue these days. I'm like, well, this is also a cheaper way to travel the world. <laughs> and I started doing research. I started with the letter A. I recorded a song from Afghanistan. And that was just so interesting, even just starting with that one. The stuff I learned, I posted a video of it on Facebook and then a friend, Romain, who runs the World Harmony Orchestra, he ended up doing a version of it with his orchestra and with a refugee choir in Islington. And it's just amazing how you can do such a small thing, like a little bit of research, a little video, and then it can have this ripple effect, yeah. which I love. Yeah. That kind of one song from every country of the world thing is definitely like an ongoing thing that I will kind of just dip in and out of. Mm -hmm. I've had lots of niggling feelings about, well, someone about a year ago said to me, have you heard of cultural appropriation? <laughs> which I certainly have. And it's just something to be aware of because you want to be culturally sensitive and there's absolutely no way I could ever pretend to be anything close to an expert in any of these different cultures and it would only ever be me putting my own personal spin or like interpreting what I hear but you don't want people thinking oh my goodness how on earth does she think she can play a song from I don't know Cameroon yeah I have to be careful about how I approach that and how I present that yeah as you say it is your own personal spin yeah and that's how art evolves I suppose isn't it exactly it, it, everyone's different approach yeah, and we don't exist in a vacuum and it would be sad to think that we did mm -hmm. and the world is increasingly globalised and yep. we have the internet, so <laughs> you can't avoid these other things. Yeah, I read an interesting quote the other day and it was, real art can only grow out of real life. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the founding principles of the Glastonbury festivals. I see. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, and that's another excuse I would give for not living in a practice room because <laughs> you right. can't create art real art with feeling if you've just been in a practice room exactly because what are you trying to say <laughs> i think a parallel would be someone doing a speech but not really believing the words they're reading out yep, exactly and you can be technically brilliant and have the most incredible voice but what are you actually saying but you'll be caught out because people will know it's not genuine yeah, yeah. blah 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 yeah. yeah that's that's the thing you do you do see inauthentic performances i suppose from yeah. people that you can tell they've spent a lot of time in the practice room and it's, wow, dizzying. And, but it doesn't have that extra energy or that message behind it. Yeah, and you wonder if you wonder why they're playing music at that point. Um, yeah. Like, are they enjoying this process? You look like you hate your instrument. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Allow me to present some other career options. There is that choreography of learning an instrument going through the motions, but also the message behind it. Yeah. I think that's why it appeals to so many people, actually, because you meet musicians and at first you think, oh, they must 
be all fairly similar, but then you realise there's so many different brands, breeds mm. of musicians. <laughs> I mean, like, that, that's why it must be so fascinating to be on audition panels mm. to an extent. I think it would also be quite soul-destroying as well. Yep. <laughs> but seeing how every single candidate presents the same piece, you know. Yep. And actually, we were having this conversation last night in our mm-hmm. Airbnb. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think I was ranting at you at about midnight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> about, about climbing. Oh, yes. And I was talking about how everyone's approach to the same problem on a climbing wall is different, you know, depending on your strengths, your weaknesses, and your flexibility, your agility. So it must be the same with audition pieces as well. And then how do you prioritize one thing over another? Yeah, and also audition panels can be 10 people sometimes, and they all have different ideas about what they want. So, I don't know, it's a minefield. Just don't do auditions. Yeah, (laughs) just... That's the moral of the story, kids. <laughs> I guess the moral would be just don't take them so seriously. Also that. And so yeah. personally. I know. But it's hard, isn't it? Because you feel like you've put so much into preparing for an audition. Yeah, you feel like they're judging you as a whole person yeah. in those five or ten minutes. Yeah, sometimes five minutes. <laughs> sometimes one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. First note of hide and D. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's meant to be an F sharp, not an F natural. Oh, no. Ah. <laughs> happened to you no that's not real by the way okay i was gonna say i'm sure it's happened to someone i hope it doesn't happen to anyone (laughs) i hope it doesn't happen to me and then how did this project lead on to your exciting travels around the world you mentioned earlier you went to south america and you've ended up in banff as well how did that come about that idea recording things from around the world sort of tied in my love of different cultures and travel and exploring different music, all of these different things, and also just having control over my own project. I know you understand that. Totally. I guess as a freelancer, it can feel like you're not always in control of your schedule or your creativity, your creative output. Yeah, exactly. So it must be really nice to have something where you're your own boss. Exactly. Um, so that was great. And then shortly after I had that idea for the project, I read about this program called the Global Leaders Program. Just saw about it on Facebook where you see all the best things. Oh, right. That, I mean, that's was not that, true. Was it a Facebook ad? I'm Facebook friends and, and real life friends with one of the trustees of this program. So she was posting about it saying, this is really great. You know how sometimes you just see something and you're like, wow, this has really arrived at the right time. Maybe it was like Ooh. creepy Facebook. Algorithm. Like yeah. what happened to me this morning. What happened to me this morning? Uh, oh, well, we're actually, we're eating, we're currently, we're munching on veggie Colin the Caterpillar sweets from M&S, and we were eating these last night as well. It's, it's, it's been a wild time, everyone. And then, yeah, a <laughs> very wild time over a cup of mint tea and fiery rhubarb and ginger tea. <laughs> wild night in Snape. Fiery. But then this morning, that's right, this morning, went on Instagram, and what did I see an ad for? Colin the there Caterpillar. Colin. I know, it's creepy. I didn't even, we didn't even post anything. We didn't, I didn't even... I don't know how What a post happened. that would have been. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Colin. Uh, yeah. It was one of those things. I don't know if I believe in fate, but it felt like it. It was a program, the Global News program. It's focused on uh, music for social change. In my year, certainly it was for 36 people. They've now expanded. They've got 50 people this year in their cohort. But it's people from all around the world. They're all musicians. Global Leaders program sounds like people trying to take on Trump, but yeah, actually... politicians or something. <laughs> which, which we should also do. It's all music-focused. Musicians who are already out there working in one way or another, but want to sort of add value to what they're doing and value to their communities and look at ways that music can help their communities in a very concrete way rather than just like, oh, maybe if we put a concert out there, someone will come along and it will make them feel a bit better, which is great. Like, I love that too. Some people have described it as like a, an MBA for musicians. So like okay. a business yeah. degree. It was at, so it's a nine month um, sort of master's level certificate. And we had seminars twice a week online, webinars, if I may. And 12 different modules and they were all directed by different people from loads of different institutions like Harvard and McGill University and yeah it was quite um, America based but then we had people from Spain and the UK and yeah it was it was amazing to just get all these different perspectives part of me was thinking okay if I do this program then maybe it can help me kind of solidify what I want to do in terms of my own projects Mm. I can take my kind of wishy-washy ideas about recording songs from around the world and try and turn it into something 
a solid project that might be able to actually impact other people yeah. somehow. We, they actually encouraged us to write a five-year plan at the beginning of this. So it was really interesting to wow. kind of look back on that. and That must and be quite reflect. tricky as a freelancer because thinking five years in advance know, is something tough. we generally don't do. What was interesting actually was that they asked us to do it handwritten, which no one ever does anymore. And I think, well, except Davina right here with her <laughs> llama notebook, everyone, <laughs> which is fabulous. I'm giving away all my trade <laughs> <laughs> But that was really interesting. I think it's, it's basically just to encourage a stream of consciousness. Yeah, I think so. That's how I feel when I write stuff down. Yeah, you can't edit out so easily. No. Um, you go old so, school. Yeah. Exactly. So that was interesting. And that program was incredible. So it was largely online, but then we had to do... Um, had to, got to, do two fieldwork assignments. They used to call them missions, but we encouraged them to change that name because it sounded either religious, religious or military. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not what we were about, necessarily. No. We did one group fieldwork assignment, so all of us went to Chile and did one of the modules um, in person out there, and then they split us into smaller groups, uh, I think seven different groups, and sent us off to different parts of the central region of Chile to work with different socially motivated music programs so I, I still can't believe it really happened I was sent off to the rainforest it was amazing so this is last January which was um, summer over yes, there yep. again this is a good good way to get over January everyone go to the southern <laughs> hemisphere I'm sure you know about that too yeah yeah if, if you can scrounge up the airfare to escape <laughs> yeah I'm still recovering from that and so yeah, I worked for about a week uh, with the music program there working with quite disadvantaged children I discovered that it was an area with the highest rate of domestic violence in the country and it was just amazing to see these kids you never want to sound patronizing but it was just amazing to see that they had a focus and this was during their, their summer holidays and, and people were interested in them and so a lot of what I do I try and link up with environmental aims as well because you know it is the biggest problem we face. It is. Um, and it was amazing to see that this program that I was working with in the rainforest was attached to this biological reserve, the Willow Willow Biological Reserve, which used to be an, a huge area for logging. And then somebody, I can't remember their name, in the 90s bought it up and turned it into this amazing ecotourism, I don't know what you call it, resort. No, it's sprawling rainforest. Um, so all of the people that were... Um, employed for logging now are employed for ecotourism and they have these um, sustainable aims so I'm very much about music programs that are in line with sustainability programs which leads me to my individual fieldwork assignment so I, I did the group thing and then I flew off to Easter Island Basically, they gave us a list of about 40 organizations they had a link with around the world and said, where do you want to go? And I saw Easter Island and I was like, right, sold. Wow. Um, did you, when you arrived, did you feel like this is just surreal? Like yes. Incredible? Absolutely amazing. The, the only way you can get there, pretty much, is a direct flight from Santiago, Chile. Because Easter Island is officially part of Chile. It has been since 1888, actually. Well Easy done. to remember. Yes, it's a five-hour flight. It's officially part of Chile, and yet it's 2,000 miles west it's of the continent. Right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, It's isn't extraordinary. It? And yeah. you, on Google Maps, you just have to keep on zooming in until you find <laughs> land. It's amazing. And I discovered that there's this organization there called Toki. Toki is actually, fun fact, the name for the stone tool they use to carve the moai. So the distinctive stone statues they have on the island, moai. moai. They use a toki to carve them out. And so Toki is the name of the organization that was set up to encourage sustainability and promotion of their indigenous culture, Mm -hmm. uh, which was sort of not allowed for a long time when Chile came along. They weren't allowed to speak their indigenous language. So this organization is trying to um, bring back the music and the language and the dances and all these things. Um, so I was able to work with them for two weeks, um, record some of their songs, which was great. So adding to your list. Exactly. Yeah. This is all part of the same plan, very loosely. Yeah. What a um, privilege, though, just to be that part of that select group. Yeah, do exactly. And like I'm that. still in touch with some of them. I'm still in, in touch very often with the violin teacher and it's it's just great to feel like you have connections everywhere and I think that's sort of the way to do it isn't it because we can all think oh I want to do this about the future or or 
whatever. But the way to do it is in a kind of roundabout way rather than directly a lot of the time. Yeah, because I think it's naive of us or maybe even arrogant to think, oh, I'm going to come up with a plan and it's going to fix things Mm -hmm. because we're just, we're all doing life for the first time and only once, I think. Um, So (laughs) there's no way we can have all the answers. But yeah, you just have to to, do a roundabout thing where you just take bits and pieces and try and do what you can along the way. As you go along. Yeah. We were talking about that last night as well, I think. About how, you know, if you set out to do only one thing, you probably won't achieve it. Yeah. Um, and quite often, amazing things happen when you don't expect it. Yeah, and they're the best things, the little side routes. Mm-hmm. You get distracted. Yeah. Like yeah. The, squ- the dog and with the squirrels and up. Squirrel! Oh, yeah. I watched that film recently, actually, mm. on... I think it was one of the many films I watched on a long haul flight, Ah. either to or from New Zealand. Up was one of them. I always cry. um, Oh, every time. Always cry. Well, just at any film, really. Especially on a plane. It's a thing. It's a thing, isn't it? Mm. It's not just me? No, apparently it's actually been scientifically proven. Why is that? Is it the altitude just makes you more emotional? Possibly that. I think for me, it's also the traveling thing, like you you're going on a big adventure it all feels quite epic yeah and if you're leaving behind loved ones as well yep that can make you quite fragile exactly i think one thing that's really set me off recently was watching bohemian rhapsody oh i haven't seen that yet oh, you haven't seen that mm. um it's, this is not a spoiler because it's based on real life but <laughs> just at, at the end there's just one shot of freddie mercury's mum watching him on tv and that just made me lose it oh yeah that would definitely I think happen to me. I just left New Zealand and I just left my mum. Yep. I was like, oh, yep. I miss you, mum. We're emotional <laughs> types, <Yeah. laughs> us musicians. Yeah. But we have to be in touch with our feelings. Mm-hmm. As we were saying before, yep. those are the emotions that we're trying That's to convey. We're in trading our music. in. <laughs> yeah, in our music making, trying yeah. to come across. So following Easter Island, mm. that led you to Banff. It did, yeah. So at the end of the Global Leaders Programme, we had to put together um, a final project. Uh, which was like putting together a full syllabus or prospectus for our own socially motivated project, music-focused socially motivated project. That's when I sort of tried to put my ideas into some kind of concrete form, um, and I came up with the idea of a ripple tank, which is a, a socially focused sound installation collective. So creating sound installations with specific communities, addressing issues that that specific community has and creating a sound installation that acts as like a sounding board so um, allowing people to air their views and explore them and then in airing them people can then listen back to other people's views and it's like a it's almost like a dialogue with a piece of art and something that can evolve through time so it's not just like a static piece of art but you can record people's responses to it and then include that in so it's always evolving and people always collaborating. Exactly, that was that was the key idea behind it. And so I wanted... To, initially, I uh, proposed a sound installation inspired... I'm not sure if I can say this word. Inspired by Brexit. Um, <coughs> <laughs> let's not talk too much about that. But I wanted to do something with refugees, um, migrants in London, speaking to them about their experiences and also recording music from their homelands, um, try and incorporate that into a sound installation. Anyway, so that was my prospectus that I did for the Global Leaders Programme, and that was kind of like the pilot idea for Ripple Tank. And then I was lucky enough to be accepted onto a residency at the Banff Centre in Canada in the Rockies. I'd always wanted to go, so it's exciting. So I went there for five weeks. I've heard Banff is an incredible place. It's Yeah, it's unreal. Is it sort of like a place where you can just really sit in your creative juices? Mm-hmm. People actually talk about the Banff effect. Not just putting on 10 pounds because the food's great, but I think something to do with the mountains um, and just having that physical space. And also, especially for us Londoners, like not having to get on public transport and not having that stress... Yeah, so not having any inhibitions to your creative mm. process. And also your, it, the support network there is incredible. You've got like-minded people. So this residency I went on, you've got about 20 other musicians also on a residency. So you're all there to do a specific project. You apply with a specific project in mind, but then you're all there to support each other as well. Yeah, I had a position out there as artistic associate, which was fun. Helped pay my way, but it was also like a, a job um, in itself. And I had to lead these 
sharing circles, which sounds like therapy and at times it was. Um, but we would all sit around every Tuesday evening and talk about what we'd been up to. And at first people were quite inhibited. They didn't know each other. They didn't quite know what the whole thing was about. But over the weeks, people really opened up and it was like, oh, I've been doing this and I'm struggling with this. And then people would share ideas and it's... So it was sort of like a hive mind. Exactly. Yeah. I think people need more of that, don't they? Yeah, Just and it made me like think... They're supported. Yeah, there, there's not enough places like that. Yeah. I'd love to make like a BAMP centre in the UK. That would be great. But we don't have the mountains, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> no mountain. We put up a nice mural or Maybe something. the Scottish Highlands. <laughs> oh, that would be You've lovely. You've seen it here first. Well, the original yeah, yeah. BAMF is in Scotland, so there we are. Maybe I'll Really? Take, yeah. So BAMF is named after a BAMF in Scotland. Exactly. Whereabouts in Scotland? I don't know. I can't think where it is, but it's up there. Banffshire. <laughs> <laughs> I applied for this BAMP residency with a view to developing this idea that I'd been running with Ripple Tank stuff. But at the time when I was applying, it really hit me that actually climate change was all I could think about. Mm -hmm. And if I was going to do my own project, I really wanted it to be based on that. And certainly as a, a my first proper project for Ripple Tank, I wanted it to be something that I was thinking about and passionate about at the time. And even though I am very passionate about um, the inclusion of immigrants and refugees in London, it I kind of felt, hang on, if we don't sort climate change, then none of this other stuff is it's important. It exist even, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know these are very grand things I was thinking, and there's no way that with one sound insulation I can solve even a shred of this problem that we have but it was for me it was like this is something I feel like I need to do yeah. so I kind of changed track slightly and um, spent my five weeks developing an idea for a sound installation that was climate change based but using songs from different cultures as my way into that yeah. Um, yeah. so I think one of the main issues with humans tackling climate change is that it feels so huge that, that we can't even begin to uh, comprehend it or mm. believe it even um and so i wanted to think of a way of trying to make it personal yeah and relatable i imagine exactly so in a way that unites everyone yeah so i wanted to prompt people to think about places that they have been to or places they're connected to that are at high risk from climate change so my kind of development phase was i picked five places that i had been to at high risk so well I chose the UK because it's my home um <laughs> there's a specific part of Orkney it's a UNESCO heritage site which is under specific threat so I chose a folk tune from there oh. um and then Montana uh, so Glacier National Park and I included um bird song uh, one of the birds that is at high risk in that specific habitat uh what else I actually used one of my recordings of the kids on Easter Island. Oh, wow. Easter Island, but sidebar, is incredible because they're actually trying to become the very first um, completely sustainable island in the world. Wow. So, I imagine they're quite high risk. They're exactly. Rising sea levels. But they also have this unique opportunity. Being a small island, they can work on that sustainability goal relatively quickly compared to you know, a huge country or continent the communication lines are a bit more open yeah and if they can achieve that quickly then they become a model for other yeah. larger countries they set an example for the rest of the world yeah so that was great i really wanted to include them anyway that's yeah. what i did I, I pieced together pieces from places i'd been to that were at high risk so that was kind of just like the prototype but what i would like to do is create a piece where people are able to offer their own places and and music and then it ends up being almost like a kind of homage to these places that might disappear yeah. soon and then suddenly people are like actually this is relevant to me this because place places that people have been to and music relating to that is so much part of people mm -hmm. and if you feel like your actual identity is being eroded that's pretty powerful yeah that's a really good way of putting it isn't it and i think easier to comprehend than the facts and figures yeah if humans whether they like it or not are pretty emotional as we've just established and if yeah if you're bringing up feelings rather than just spouting numbers then yeah i mean that's why we like art isn't it rather mm -hmm. than uh, science yeah. <laughs> over here well i think i think as a, that can be a, a problem isn't it is a lot of people's need to quantify things and so that's why you get the numbers that can go over a lot of people's heads but if you put it in a language such as art, music, 
that people understand. It hits home a lot harder. It sure does. And I like the idea of a sound installation because it is immersive. Mm -hmm. So obviously this would include some visual aspect as well. I've got a venue lined up where I can potentially do this for the first time. That's exciting. This great place. I will plug it here because I love it so much. It's called The Exchange in Erith, which is southeast London. And they're new. Well, it's, it's the old library building. And this wonderful couple has taken it on as a project for community artistic projects so I'm hopefully going to do the first incarnation in there exciting and I imagine with a sound installation you get people dipping in and out in various states of consciousness Mm -hmm. don't you because the various sound installations that I've experienced you might not necessarily realize that you're being part of it and that way you get people from all different walks of life becoming Exactly. I think that's one of the main reasons I was drawn to sound installations, um, especially ones in public places, so not like within an art gallery, because you can, it sounds slightly sinister, but you can catch people off guard (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. when they're least Mm -hmm. expecting it. Catch people's attention. Exactly. That that they weren't expecting. and And also they're free to go whenever they want to. They're free to enter and leave that space when they want to. And I think that's important. Yeah, You might have just given them a little thing to think about. Yeah. And also because um, there's no sort of start or finish time, like with a concert, everyone will have a different experience of it. Mm -hmm. Like if I've got music looping or different bits of music overlapping, then no one experience is going to be the same. And people will just bring to it what they're feeling at the time um, and and the way that they're interpreting it. So watch this space. That's really exciting. Mm. Well, you'll have to keep us posted. I shall. Yeah. So I mentioned before there'd be some surprise questions. Oh, here we go. <laughs> love hearing everyone's reactions. <laughs> so as you may know, in previous episodes, we have the wild card question round. Wild. That's not that wild. I wrote these <laughs> questions while you were sleeping. Because <laughs> I am wild. <laughs> a wild night out. <laughs> a wild night in, I should say. With Colin the caterpillar. Yep. In Snape. <laughs> Snape. Snape. <laughs> Severus, Severus. Snake. Yep. Um, so the wild card question round, this is your chance to choose what I ask you next based on three topics. That mm. I present you. This is fun. I'm, it's like I'm on a game show. Oh, Love I it. like when people say that. <laughs> Would you ever go on a game show? Yeah. Which one? Ooh, is this the question? No. Is this the wild card question? <laughs> no, it's not. Um, you haven't chosen it. I've just asked you. Who wants to be a millionaire would be quite fun. Oh, I couldn't yeah. say that. Who wants to be a millionaire? There we are. <laughs> <laughs> because I never will be because I'm a musician. <laughs> Hey, you never know. Yeah. What would your speciality topic be? Oh, do you, Is that what they have that in there? Um, no, or am I thinking about Oh, it would else? be Disney, hands Disney. down. Disney. I don't oh, yeah. think I get to choose on who wants to be a millionaire, but hands right. down, Disney, speciality yeah. topic. Ace all the Disney questions. Fact. Yeah. That's brilliant. That would have been a good wild card question for you. Mm. What's your favourite Disney film? Um, actually, well, it depends which era we're talking about. Okay, but yeah. Most recent times, Moana, and when I went to East of Ireland, I felt like Moana. Oh, <laughs> I am Moana. I may have sung that a lot to myself when I was there. And actually, I was happy to learn that they, uh, lots of people on the island did appreciate that film. Right. I was worried that it might be insensitive, but actually mm-hmm. Disney is great because it does so much research. Yeah, they were informed. Yeah. yeah. So You're going to hate me, but I watched the first 10 minutes of it and then I switched it off. Right, I might have to leave now. I'm sorry. I was on a plane. Maybe I was feeling a bit emotional. But um, <laughs> I, I watched it. I just wasn't in the mood for some reason. Oh, if only I, we had one more night in Snape. Well, I think oh, you may need to educate me on Fine. Moana. Also, uh, because it's my one of my nephew's favourite films. So I need to <laughs> educate myself so I can bond it's properly. It's my nieces them. too. Yeah. 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 So, okay, wild card questions. <laughs> we have travel destinations, Ooh. which could work quite well with mm-hmm. what you've just been talking about animals oh you're picking on my favorite things right now oh it's gonna be a hard choice secret talents okay well i don't have any of those so um (laughs) you just have very public talents (laughs) i don't know about that either travel destinations okay okay where next oh good question i mean the thing about me is that i have many many itineraries written in my head or in my notes on my phone things I may not ever do but I just one of my very favorite things in life is planning trips 
I love Google very much. You're very good at planning all your travel and accommodation for I think it's I all enjoy your touring. It. Yeah. I mean, you booked this Airbnb months ago and I didn't have to do anything. Yeah. Thank well, you. Uh, my pleasure. You're a good person um, to know. But yeah, it's fortunate that I enjoy that stuff. Yeah, so the next trip, which I've pretty much already planned, I'm hoping will be Japan. Oh. For my honeymoon. Hey, Yay. congratulations. Yay. Of course, because you just got engaged I did. very recently. Hooray. That's um, very cool. So, yeah, I mean, this itinerary has been around for a long time, so it'll be nice to actually do it. I've never been to Japan. No, so many musicians seem to be going to Japan lately, actually. Lots, Lots of people tours. have been touring there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite sort of Scandinavian in a way, I think, Japan, in its kind of um, <laughs> minimalist restraint. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like geographically, no, but <laughs> not at all, not at all. But um, I love Scandinavia, and yeah. my fiance is half Swedish, and I feel like it's sort of exploring the world yeah. in a different Scandinavian kind of way. That doesn't yeah. make any sense at all. Uh, I mean, we'll just go with that. Yeah, but yeah, sure. that that sounds really exciting. I've never been to Japan myself, but I imagine that I would have a really wonderful time eating there. Yeah, look forward to the food and. I hear wonderful things about cherry blossoms, but this is just bringing up terrible memories about what ha- what has happened in Japan this morning for my country. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned. <laughs> no, you <laughs> didn't. I mentioned it myself. Traumatic. New Zealand is now out of the Rugby World Cup. It's really sad. I know. And you, you witnessed every reaction. I honestly wanted New Zealand to win just for Davina. <laughs> <laughs> because Davina. Because <laughs> she was next to me at the time. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry for any bad words I said. I think you woke me up (laughs) shouting at the screen, actually. But, you know. Well, you had to wake up at some point because our breakfast was arriving. Fact, yep. And Mm. relating to travel destinations, what's your favourite place you've been to? Oh, gosh. Well, I think Easter Island would be up there Mm. for sure. Just knowing how far away from everything else you are. It's amazing just feeling that remoteness. Mm. Um, And actually, so Mahani, who is... Uh, one of the founders of Toki, this organization that I was working with, and she's a concert pianist. On one of our days off, she took me to the very highest point on the island. And Easter Island is triangular, mm-hmm. and each point is um, a dormant volcano. Right. So from the very top, you can see each of those corners. And you just honestly feel like you're on the top of the world. Yeah. Sounds like a cliche, but you really do. There's nothing obstructing your view. Incredible. That's incredible. And also that feeling of, luckiness i suppose yeah is that a word luckiness absolutely i'll it? take it that you are one of very select few people to have yeah. gone there and also um because i was being hosted by well the violin teacher who lives there obviously has lived there for 20 years and i was working with local people you, you get a very um unique viewpoint you're not just a tourist yeah you get that sense of community yeah you? absolutely yeah. i know i did feel very lucky to be accepted into that um, because they're very rightfully protective of their culture and i was being asked to kind of participate in that, which you can't really beat. This is related to one of the other wildcard questions that I had prepared, but did you see any good animals on Easter Island? Do you know what? Not so many because I think because it is so remote. Um, <laughs> they don't have so many. Lots of the animals, I think, were brought over with the early Europeans who sure, visited, sailors, yeah. who found it on Easter Sunday, which is why it's called Easter Island. Uh-huh. Um, so it's actually Rapa Nui, that's the yeah. indigenous name. Lots of horses around. I had three cockroaches in oh, that's not fun. the cabin no. where I was staying. And I totally freaked out when I first saw them. And then, having been there for almost two weeks, I started to get a bit worried if I couldn't find them. Um, partially because I was like, well, are they in my bed? But also because I grew quite attached to them. Oh, did you give them names? One of them was Carlos, for sure. <laughs> and I'm afraid I can't remember the other two. They were obviously alliterative because yeah, cause like, we're all big children, really. Colin the Caterpillar. Yeah, exactly, yeah. like a kid's book. Um, Carlos the Cockroach. Yeah, so that's probably not the kind of answer you were after. You were after, like, these big animals. <laughs> no. But... Um, Three but cockroaches. I, I will take that. You saw three cockroaches. Yeah, including Carlos. Oh, I don't miss cockroaches. Living in Australia, terrifying. You saw animals. them there. But yep. yeah, cockroaches were pretty grim, actually. I remember walking down the streets at night time in Sydney and you'd just hear crunch, crunch, oh. crunch because you're <laughs> just standing on a carpet of cockroaches. Ooh. How's that Gosh, for that's alliteration? That's good alliteration. <laughs> New Zealand, not so much. Just nice, peaceful birds and 
lizards. Oh, actually, that's high up on my list as well, New Zealand. Oh, you got to go. I am desperate to go. You'd love it. Oh. Record some music while you're there. I know. Yeah. Actually, I have had um, a New Zealand offering for my project <gasps> already. Uh, so how can people get in touch with you regarding your project hmm. submissions? Well, um, when I started my residency at Banff, I created a blog just as a way of letting out all of my thoughts. It hasn't been particularly active recently because all my thoughts have been kind of in my head. But writing is one of my very, very favourite things. So once something is a bit more concrete, it will all come flooding out. But yes, rippletank.org. Is that what it is? You sound very unsure. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Rippletank.org. She said with furrowed eyebrows. Yes. And that's where people can get in touch. They can. And find out more about your project. Exactly. And there's obviously always plans for brand new shiny websites. But, you know, watch this space. You know what? I've I've even got the domain name and, yeah, I've got plans to set up a website for this podcast. And it has not, It'll happen. Yeah, but it's not happened yet. It'll happen even, as it comes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I even got the phone call from GoDaddy like a few weeks ago saying, is everything okay? Oh. <laughs> like, we noticed that you've purchased this domain name, but you haven't done anything about it. I'm like, Far too busy I and important. I don't really know how. <laughs> and they had to put me on some special program, like, you know, dragon. Not like a support program. Yeah, like a sort of uh, making a website for dummies. Sort of oh, thing. nice. Yeah. Just, so, we do watch the space. There will be a website coming soon. Excellent. Yeah, I also bought sophiegladhill.com probably about 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I bought my, my name, yeah. domain name as well. Haven't done anything It'll about it. It'll be worth a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think 99p. <laughs> Go ready. <laughs> Love it. Brilliant. Thank you so much for being Thank on the Thank you. Podcast. It's been very fun. It's been wonderful to hear about your travels and your creative process and also sharing thoughts over cups of tea and Colin the Caterpillars. <laughs> Well, Colin and I are so grateful. <laughs> Colin's grateful. You've been eating him. It's a circle of life. <laughs> There's the Disney thing. But I'm also vegetarian, um, so yeah. They're veggie ones. It's yeah, okay. it's all right. Yeah. It's all good. Thanks very much. Thank you, Davina. Hope you enjoyed my chat with the champion cellist, Sophie Gledhill. She's going to appreciate that alliteration. I feel like I could chat to Sophie for ages. We stayed in an Airbnb the night before and chatted well into the night after our first show. She joked, oh God, you haven't been recording this whole time, have you? <laughs> and while a four-episode Sophie Gladhill special would be fantastic, I couldn't have guaranteed much coherency from our tired, rambly, Colin the caterpillar fueled conversation. <laughs> this episode's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from an anonymous contributor who plays the cello. It's come via email. Music College didn't prepare me for a student production of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. This was an outdoor production, already every string player's nightmare. Not only have you got to make sure the sun isn't ruining the varnish on your instrument, or the wind isn't blowing your music away, you also have to keep checking that the weird change in temperature hasn't made all your strings go out of tune. For this production of Narnia, we were in a beautiful garden and the director had decided to move the different parts of the action to different areas of the garden. Ah, what a lovely idea, you might think. Think again. I was part of a group of about ten musicians, already fairly cheesed off at being made to play outside. We were now told that to keep the action going, they decided that we would play, oh, capital letters, on the move to guide the audience from one section of the garden to the other. But I'm a cellist, I objected. We've thought of that, said the director smugly. Everyone will have a sheet of music stuck to their back so that the player behind them can read their part as they walk along. But I'm a cellist, I tried again, slightly louder this time. We can't play while moving along. It's a sort of sitting down kind of instrument. The director's reaction was a massive eye-roll in a would-you-look-at-the-diva kind of manner. After much protesting on my part, it was decided that I could sit and play my part while the other instruments continued with the whole music-on-the-back-of-the-person-walking-in-front-of-you plan. So what would happen would be we'd start off playing together, the rest of the band would start moving away while playing, followed by all the audience, a progressivo, and I would be left playing my part on my own, trying to stay in time with the rest of the musicians as they moved gradually out of earshot. 
This would be followed by a mad frenzy of picking up my cello, music stand and chair, legging it to a different part of the garden as I manoeuvred my way back to the rest of the band, usually amidst annoyed shushing from the audience, where I would then have a few scenes to catch my breath before the whole routine would begin again. Yeah, that sucks. Logistically, it's just a mission playing the cello. You lack the mobility that other instruments have. Even just putting your instrument down, picking it up again is a pain, takes up loads of space. People just don't seem to see you because you're sitting down. The number of times I've had to swerve to avoid skewering passers-by with my bow. You need the right chair, you need the right surface to put your spike into. It's just so many things to think about. Still, at least it's not the double bass. <laughs> Thanks, anonymous contributor, for your story. If you have a story that Music College didn't prepare you for, then let me know at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or on social meds. That's it for today. Special thanks to Ros Nagy for my logo and Daniel Elms for my jingle. Cheers to Sophie Gladhill for many informative and entertaining chats throughout that weekend back in October. And thank you for listening. Stay in touch with the podcast by emailing me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com. Like and follow the pod on Facebook and Instagram at As It Comes Pod. Remember to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. Chat to you soon. Bye.